Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here and enjoy what you are listening to or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help this channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy Stalker Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. When I was in high school, I lived in a really small town in Texas. It was the kind of place where everyone was either related to each other or hated each other. I had no family there, so yeah, but I did have a pretty blonde girlfriend and was pretty hated for that too. Nothing major, just petty harassment, occasional fights, but it had been escalating. So that's why on Valentine's Day, my girlfriend and I decided to skip the school dance and just stay in and watch a movie at her house while her parents went out. Just better to avoid trouble. We borrowed her dad's car, a little Honda hatchback, and went into town. We stopped at the video store for a movie and went to the Dairy Queen for some ice cream and headed home. Now, she lives in the complete boonies, out in the middle of the woods along a lonely road with no street lights. We're chatting, eating our blizzards, when all of a sudden, a car comes up behind us. No big deal. What was a very big deal was that when the headlights flooded the interior of our car, I saw two hands on the back seat and a head coming from the hatchback part of the car. As soon as the lights hit, the head and hands retreated back down. A solid, cold chill ran through my entire length of my body. I slowly reached down and pulled out my pocket knife. It's the only thing I had on me. She saw me and asked what was wrong. Loudly, I said, Oh, nothing. I just have to stop at my friend's house real quick. She knew that was bullshit. I didn't have any friends. I pulled over at the next house and came up and jumped out of the car, yelling at her to jump out too. She jumped out in total confusion. I flipped the driver's seat forward and lunged into the back seat in full maniac mode. He popped up like a jack-in-the-box with empty hands, waving. Hey, 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 uh, <laughs> what are y'all up to tonight? <laughs> it was some weird kid from our high school who we had never in our entire lives spoken to before. Ever. I said, what in the holy fuck are you doing in our car? His reply was, I thought you guys were going to the dance and I was just hitching a ride. We sat there staring at him with our mouths wide open, wondering what to do. He tried to act real cool, and obviously we were in the middle of nowhere in some random person's driveway. So whatever he was planning was forgotten. We actually ended up driving him to the dance and dropping him off. The whole time he's telling us to come inside with him. Yeah, no. We dropped his ass off and noped the hell out of there as soon as we could. As soon as he got out of the car, my girlfriend started crying and shaking. She was so freaked out. I have no idea what he was trying to do when the lights caught him, crawling out of the hatchback. I fucking hated that high school. Before I begin my story, I apologize, as English is not my native language. So, at the time of this story, I was around 13 or 14 years old. I used to take horseback riding lessons, and the center I had to go to was pretty far from my home. 
Since there was no public transports to go there, they provided a shuttle to pick us up at a certain location in hours. The nearest shuttle stop to my house was at a city exit. Basically, the city exit was a huge traffic roundabout leading to the city ring, some huge avenues with sports centers, a lot of them, by the way, and the entrance of a huge park or forest where the riding stables were, and known for its prostitutes. If I had children, I surely would not let them go there alone. But 14-year-old me decided it was a perfect spot to wait for the shuttle. I went there to take the 17 shuttle, arrived 30 minutes early just to be sure, and sat on a bench near one of the sports centers. It was the first time I had to take it. You had to wave at the driver in order for him to stop, but I had no idea what the shuttle looked like. No logo or whatsoever painted on this minibus. Just all white and blue. So I waited and waited until about 4.15 p.m. No shuttle. 20 minutes passed. Still no shuttle. I began to panic a bit. What if I didn't see it? At this point, I was standing up. Maybe the driver would stop if he saw a young girl in riding clothing. Still nothing, and it was getting dark. Then I noticed a car, a very old one, so quite noticeable parked a bit further up the road with a guy in it. I thought to myself that maybe he was waiting for someone in the sports center. I was and still am very anxious, so having a man sitting in a car with a nice view of me waiting stressed the hell out of me. Another 20 minutes later, and bingo, a crowd of people go out of the sports center, and one of them got into the car. I was relieved. Or so I thought, because they did not move. I started to panic. Now there were two guys in a car, and they were watching me. In my stupid teen mind, I started to hope for the 615 shuttle. It was really dark now, and I couldn't read the signs on the shuttles anymore. Scared, I decided at 620 it was time for me to go home. I started walking, and at the moment I moved from my spot, the guys started up their car. I tried to stay as calm as possible and not run, because I thought that if I started to run or scream for help, they would get out of their car and kidnap me. I tried to contact my mom, but she didn't respond, and of course, my phone battery died shortly after. To get back home from there, I had to walk down one long road for approximately 10 minutes and then take a turn onto my street. My initial plan was to kind of disappear into the crowd once I would reach the more busy areas. But that night, there were nobody in the streets, of course. And I couldn't deviate from the road because I didn't know the place very well and didn't have a map. The car was clearly following me, very slowly, and with its lights at maximum intensity. In my city, everybody drove crazy fast and never at maximum lights because of street lighting. We don't call it the city of lights for nothing. So it was indeed suspicious. Five minutes before arriving home, the car was still behind me. It was at this moment I realized I just couldn't head straight home, or they would know where I lived. So I finally had this idea. Turn on a street they couldn't turn onto. I finally was in my neighborhood, a place I knew like my own pocket. So I turned onto a small one-way lane road and ran like I've never ran before in my life. I often read that people run and don't even look behind them, but I sure in the hell did and I saw that their car had stopped at the turn. They could not drive there because other cars were passing in the street. Game over. I have no idea what would have happened if I had led them to my place, and I'm really glad they didn't get out of their car. So, to the creepy guys chilling in their car, I hope I don't run into you again.
This is my first time writing down this story, so please forgive my grammatical errors. This happened about a year ago to me now. I've only ever shared the story with a couple of people. However, I thought it couldn't hurt to share it with you. Big, big disclaimer before going forward. Don't worry, I realize I was a huge idiot in this situation and my choices could have put me in danger. However, I made it out alive and unharmed and that's all that matters. Even if I was too panicked, to think properly and act like a right idiot. Also, before I forget to mention it, I'm a 21-year-old female. So, it was around June of 2019. I was doing a closing shift at the McDonald's I worked at in town. I live in England, originally from Scotland. We close up at 2 a.m. on weekdays and 3 a.m. on the weekend. It had been a Saturday night shift, so I was finished and out of the building by about 3.15 a.m., roughly. When this happened, I was living about a 10 to 15 minute walk from my work in a flat that was mostly taken up by students. I didn't have money to spare to constantly get taxis, and I had been walking home at night for the past year with no incidents. So of course, I didn't think any differently of doing it again. Majority of the walk was fine, and I was about four minutes away from the flat, when I noticed a guy just standing around near the corner I had to turn to get home. I'm very wary when I see other people, but usually they're drunk and mind their own, or just ask for directions, or it's a homeless person, as there's quite a lot in the city I live in. But at that time of night again, they usually keep to themselves. This guy was dressed nice but casual, looked around mid-twenties, I would say, well-groomed, tan skin, and this really strong-smelling aftershave. He obviously was a regular at the gym, too, because he had a muscular figure and didn't seem to be too drunk by the looks of things, but who knows. I tried to keep my distance, but he approached me and started making really casual conversation, asking me what my name was, complimenting my accent, and asking where I was from. I stupidly engaged with him, but gave him a fake name and made it clear I wasn't up for a chat. I should have been firm with my words, but I'm way too introverted and shy to speak up. Even my boyfriend complains that I talk too quietly sometimes, and I struggle to be direct with people. Throughout the entire conversation, he was always giving me this unsettling smile and would try to touch my arm or play with my hair, which I made as clear as I possibly could that I didn't approve of. Not that he was even listening, he would just say something along the lines of, but you're just so pretty. Not flattering at all when it's a man who won't take no for an answer. Anyways, this guy asks me for a hug and even though I refused him as politely as possible, he did it anyways. I froze up for a couple of seconds before I moved away, which thankfully he let me go. He was being extremely creepy at this point and tried feeling over my sides as he hugged me, which gave me even more alarm bells ringing in my head. I told him I had to leave, and as I was walking away, I heard, I'll walk you home. Where do you live? Unfortunately, I had nowhere else to go but home. Nobody else was around, and it was too early in the morning. My roommate was also back at his own house, as he went back home every weekend. I had a hold of my keys in my pocket and just hoped once I got to the building I could find a way in without this guy being able to invite himself in behind me. I refused the walk home, but he followed me anyways, walking about eight or ten feet away from me as I was speeding up at this point. but caught up as I crossed the road. I don't know why, but I decided to go the long way to get to my building, which is an extra two minutes, so not that long. And as I was approaching the flat, 
I felt this horrible sinking feeling in my chest. The door to the building closes really slow at first before slamming shut. So I knew even if I walked in, he could potentially follow me inside. And that puts me at an even greater risk. By this point, he was begging to be led inside. He said he was extremely thirsty and wanted some water. But I told him my roommate is sleeping. A subtle way to try to deter him by showing I wasn't alone, but that didn't seem to faze him. He was trying to be touchy and just kept pleading with me to be let inside, but I kept my ground and said no as best as possible. As he was walking to me, I managed to use my fob on the door and only open it enough to carefully slide through. However, he was right at the door, and I didn't want to make him upset, so I apologized and told him no once again. Luckily, he had to move away from the door as someone wanted to get into the building. The guy entering the flat asked if everything was okay when he saw me, but I stupidly said everything was fine. That did give me a chance to move away from the door and let it close once the guy walked through. He either worked or lived there, but I wasn't sure. I didn't even look back to the guy. I just ran up the stairs to my flat as fast as I could. I didn't get any sleep that night, and from that moment on, I made sure to always have money aside for a taxi. I think I walked home maybe once more between June to October before I moved. Really scary stuff, and I'm glad I never saw him again after that. Back in December of 2004, doesn't seem real, it's been almost 10 years, I was living in Portland, Oregon, attending college. I was sitting at home one night, writing my last research paper for the term. I had my Yahoo instant messenger up, chatting to a few friends, when a message from someone not on my list pops up. Have you ever thought about suicide? Uh, okay weird. But hey, it's almost midnight on a Sunday night and stranger things have been asked to me before. Can I see your tits? Etc. So I messaged the stranger back for kicks. Sure. Who hasn't at some point? Why? Well, asking that question opened Pandora's box. He battered me with questions about how I wanted to die. Why did I want to die? Would I want to die with others, etc. Obviously getting creepier and creepier as the conversation continues. But I play along, assuming the guy is just screwing around with me. I ask him his name. He says it's Jerry, and I ask to see a picture. He sends me to a profile pic on Hot or Not and asks me if I think he's good looking. I tell him, sure, yeah, you're cute or whatever. He asks to see a picture of me. I send him a random old photo of a girl on my MySpace friends list. Yes, it's that old, I realize now. And he tells me he thinks I'm a 10. Awesome, thanks Jerry, who is obsessed with suicide. As the conversation continues, he tells me he's sick of life and women don't seem to be attracted to him, so he wants to end it all. I tell him the things you're supposed to say to people in this situation. Relationships are nothing. You're more important to the people in your life. Don't do it. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not heartless, but I just don't feel like talking someone off a ledge at 1 a.m. Jerry tells me he's met a lot of women online that want to kill themselves and that he's planning a party for Valentine's Day, one and a half months away from now. So everyone can come and do it together at his house in Klamath Falls, Oregon. He asks me if I'm interested in joining. I say, yeah, sure, but make an excuse that I don't have a car to get down there for it. He tells me there are a few women from Portland 
coming down for it, and one of them has a van. He's sure I can catch a ride. He says he's built a beam in his home that will hold up to 50 bodies at once and that I shouldn't wear shoes because they'll weigh me down. By now, yes, I'm starting to realize this guy is acting extremely serious. And this is, in fact, not a joke. So I start asking him specifics. What is his address? What his full name is? Who are the women traveling from Portland? He tells me their names and that one of them is bringing her five children with her and they want to die as well. Huge red flags are up at this point. So while I'm still chatting with him, I call a friend of mine back home in Eastern Oregon who works as a 911 dispatcher. She's actually at work when I call her and after telling her the whole story, she advises me to hang up and call Portland Police Department right away. At least give them the info to pass to Klamath Falls. She makes a record in their system that I've called just in case. I keep talking to Jerry and call the Portland Police. They send two officers out about an hour later and they pretty much laugh at me when I explain to them what's going on. I print out our chat log give them the guy's full name and address I've already verified through Google as being legit, as far as Google can. And they tell me to just quit talking to him. Simple as that and go on about their business. Don't I feel stupid now? I call my friend back home and tell her what Portland PD did and she said to keep an eye on things. If he keeps talking, just keep saving the conversation. So I do. For another two hours, and things just get to the point where I can't handle him anymore. He's battering me with questions about how I want to die, wearing clothes or naked. Do I want to have sex before I die? Would I have problem killing kids before? Would I want to hold hands with others while we hang? Finally, I just told him I'd be in touch closer to Valentine's Day. For the most part, I laugh it off with some friends because Portland PD never got back to me about anything. So of course I assumed it ended up being a very strange prank. Fast forward, February 10th, 2005. A friend of mine calls me while I'm on campus on my way to work and tells me some guy down in Klamath Falls has been arrested for trying to set up a pack suicide for Valentine's Day. I'm floored. I run to my office, log into a computer, and sure enough, it's everywhere on all news forums. Gerald Crean arrested for plotting mass suicide Valentine's Day party. My friend from back home sees the news and calls me, tells me I need to call back to the Portland PD and tell them I called this in back in December. I make the call, and an hour later, two FBI agents are coming to pick me up at my job, taking me home, and taking my entire computer to be analyzed. We sit in my living room, and I'm questioned over and over about my involvement and if I was really planning to commit suicide. I kept telling them over and over that I just talked to the guy as a joke, thought it was some sort of prank and that I only called the cops when he started talking about some women from Portland bringing their kids. And I'd given all the information to the Portland PD officers back in December. How was I supposed to know they never did anything with it? Which they didn't. They sat on it, probably shredded it, and never even sent any of the info to Klamath Falls. The agents tell me the story has gotten a lot bigger and that Crean had contacted hundreds of people. At least 30 had agreed to come on Valentine's Day to his house and commit suicide together. One woman, her parents, found some emails between she and Crean and called the police. That's how they finally got involved. Not for me nearly two months ago. This happened less than a week before Valentine's Day. I'm freaked out. They drop me back off at the college and I tell my boss everything that happened. She tells me that reporters have been calling non-stop 
since I left, wanting to talk to me. She said she didn't give them my cell phone number, but that she thought it was only a matter of time before they showed up at the office. I was a student worker. My name is on the campus website and directory, etc. If the AP got a hold of a police report, there was no saying how fast they could start tracking me down. I call my mom, tell her what's happened. She tells me she'll be up that evening to come get me and bring me home for a break. I take four days off, turn in what assignments I have left. The FBI has the rest on my tower and head off to Eastern Oregon to wait out the media. Big mistake. Huge. Because by the time I make it back home that night, they'd already tracked down my brother and my sister-in-law thought it was so cool that ABC and CNN wanted to talk to me. She gave them my parents' address and my cell phone number. She's a fucking idiot. I was harassed, chased down, and semi-terrorized until I finally gave in and gave an interview to Good Morning America. I hoped it would die down then. The story was out. Who cares? Wrong. Just wrong. Apparently, every fucking outlet cares until you give them the 15 seconds of conversation the others didn't get. I had my 15 seconds of fame, and I never want to deal with that shit again. Crean is still sitting in the Salem State Hospital for his crimes of solicitation to commit murder. Mr. Have You Ever Thought of Suicide? I really hope that you are getting the help that you need. If you or anyone you know are thinking about committing suicide, there are tools out there that can help you. You can call 988 for their crisis hotline, or you can also text HOME to 741741. This happened to me when I was 11, or if you will, in 2005. It was a usual summer day for me. I got up at about noon, went on a bike ride with my brother, then came home and spent most of the remaining daylight in our above ground pool. We were well off, but by no means rich. So as I was relaxing for the night and intent on spending the rest of the night playing video games, I decided to check my MySpace profile really quickly and spend some of the energy on my games there. As I finish off my Dog Wars energy bar, I'm fit to close out the browser and head back downstairs to play some PlayStation. When I get a friend request, Allie, 13, three hours away from nowhere, Kentucky. I click the name because I didn't know an Allie, not even an Allison or really any girl who had A names at all. She was pretty. An 11-year-old me just scoffed like, why would she want to be friends with me? I almost ignore it. Almost. I accepted the request, and with not much else to do, I sent her a message asking a simple question like, should I know you from somewhere? She tells me we've not met, but she's friends with one of my friends, Mike. I check out her profile, see she and Mike share a lot of common interests, or on each other's friends list, so it checks out. I don't message Mike to ask him about her, but I was a very trusting young boy and had no reason to believe she was anything but what she said she was. For the next few weeks, I'd talk to her every night, for no less than three hours usually. We'd just chat about things, school, music, television, you know, typical kid stuff. I didn't really think anything about it more than just being MySpace friends until she said that she liked me. I sort of laughed it off, thinking she just meant like in the way friends like each other. However, she clarified that she meant she had feelings for me and wanted to meet me in real life. She lived pretty far away from me, so I didn't really see how this would even be possible. I knew my parents were not about to take me to some girl I'd met online's house. I wouldn't want them to in the first place, 
They were decent parents and all. I just never felt I could talk to them about these kind of things, so I just sort of shrugged it off. I told her it'd be hard for us to meet because as much as I'd like riding my bike, a three-hour bike ride to a part of the state I'd hardly ever seen before was not something I'd be comfortable doing. She was very understanding and said that she, at least, wanted to talk on the phone instead of just messages. I agreed, but told her to never call my number and to always let me be the one to call her because I didn't want my parents picking up and asking questions. She understood, and I called her. The first time I got her dad, and he gave me a gruff, Who is this? It was weird because I had the phone with me at the computer and told her I was calling, and she said she had the phone with her as well. However, I didn't think anything of it at all. I told him it was James and that I was looking for Allie. He told me to hold on a second and there was a rustling sound on the phone, like someone trying to make it sound like they were handing it over to someone. Again, I didn't really think anything of it, and when I heard a high-pitched, Hello? I didn't really think anything more of it. We talked for a few minutes, then she said she had to go because her dad was expecting a call as well. I shrugged it off and told her to just message me, and we can talk again later. We kept messaging back and forth for a while, and before I knew it, it was almost the end of the summer, and she was not satisfied, having not met me in person yet. So, she posed an idea. She said there was an end-of-summer event going on at a lake near my house. She said she and her family used to go there sometimes, and that she could probably talk them into going there for the event. My family usually went to the area on the 4th of July and stuff like that, and having just had a nice time there in July, it wasn't too hard for me to convince my folks as well. A few nights later, she lets me know that they had agreed and that she was super excited to finally meet me. She told me she was going to kiss me as soon as she saw me, and I just sort of blushed and tried my best to make it sound like it wasn't a big deal, like I was some stud who kissed plenty of girls before. But I wasn't. I was totally pumped to finally kiss a girl, and it was only a few nights away. I had a hard time sleeping the next couple of nights, and I stayed up most of the night talking to Allie. We were both excited and couldn't wait to meet. It was very much a magical experience. The night before, I think I stayed up until 8 a.m. talking to her. So the day had come, and after an early afternoon bike ride and a short swim, our family loaded into the car and my dad took the truck so that me and my brother could take our bikes to the lake with us. There was plenty of bike trails and we always enjoyed riding there. I told my brother I wasn't going to be hanging out with him the whole night, however, and would only ride with him a little bit before I went to meet another friend. He wanted to tag along, like little brothers often do, and I quickly convinced him he didn't want to hang out with me because the kids were mean and I was only hanging out with them because of one of them. He didn't ask any questions after that. About an hour later, the sun was starting to set, and my brother said he was going back to meet with our parents anyway. He didn't like riding in the dark. He had a habit of crashing as it was. So when I ventured off on my own, it was without hindrance. I made my way to the picnic area Allie and I had agreed to meet at and I sat on one of the picnic tables, my bike resting against the side. I sat for a long time, so long that I started to get worried and was ready to leave because the fireworks were about to start and Allie hadn't shown up yet. I stood up and jumped down from the picnic table and just as I did, a rusty old white pickup truck pulled up beside the table. The man inside reached across the cab to roll down the window and gave me a weird smile, telling me that he was Allie's dad and that he was going to take me to her. 
I started feeling strange about the situation, so I just gave him a blank stare and said, What? He turned the engine off, thinking maybe I could hear him over the sound of it, and climbed out of the truck. I said, I'm here to take you to Alley. Hop on in, he said, opening the passenger door and motioning me to climb in. The truck was full of garbage and it looked very dirty, and I could smell oil and other things coming from the truck. I gave a crooked look and told him I wasn't going to be getting in his truck. As he grabbed my arm and pulled me towards the truck, I realized pretty quickly what he was all about. Get in the damn truck, he barked, squeezing my arm so tightly that I thought it was broken. I pulled away, practically giving myself an Indian burn as I told him I was leaving. He came after me, so I did the only thing I could think to do to repel a grown man twice my size and probably thrice my age. I reared back and kicked him as hard as I could, square in the balls. I didn't bother to wait to see how he handled the blow. I hopped on my bike and pedaled with all of my might back to the other side of the lake where my family was. He didn't follow me. At least, I don't think he did. If he did, he might have seen my dad, who was a rather large guy and definitely not someone you'd want to fight with after he had had a few beers. I never saw him again, and when I got home and went to message Allie to tell her what a jerk her dad was, the profile was gone. I saw Mike just before school started, and he said he had no idea who Allie was, and didn't even remember adding her on MySpace. It wasn't until some years later I realized how terribly close I'd come to being abducted, and God knows what that man wanted to do to me. To any of you out there that are meeting people online, please use caution and stay safe. This story happened quite a few years ago, when I was much younger and more naive. I want to preface this story by stating that I have learned my lesson. I am now in a happy and long-term relationship that has taught me a lot about my self-worth. Also, I apologize for the length and any unnecessary details. It has been a long time since I have let myself think about it, and it was quite cathartic to write all of this down. This started my second year of university. I am a female and overweight. I was very focused on my studies while in high school, so even though I had a large group of friends and went to parties, I always put school first. I didn't dare because I saw it as a distraction, and to be completely honest with myself, no one was really interested in me. Most of my male friends were gay, and the straight ones were already dating all of my other friends. It wasn't until university that I decided maybe it was time for me to open myself up to the concept that I could start dating and share my time with someone. So about a week before school started, I was heading to our local mall to hang out with some friends and to buy some new clothes for the year. I just needed enough nice things for the first week and then I couldn't care less what I looked like. At this time, I had a license, but I did not possess the car, so the only means of transportation available to me were walking, friends that took pity on me, and the bus. Unfortunately, today I was at the mercy of public transportation. I was already on my connecting bus heading to the mall when I watched as a young guy walked onto the bus he looked to be a few years older than me and was in quite good shape. As this was the bus heading to the mall, the route was quite busy and my seat was the last seat open. He proceeded to sit right next to me. I don't pay him much attention as I was texting my friend. When I was finished texting, I did everything I could not to engage with the guy beside me. My phone was an older phone that had a slide-out keyboard, but no internet access or games. 
Like I said, this happened a while ago. I was able to avoid his stare for about 10 minutes more until he shifted his weight and I made accidental eye contact with him. It was at this point that he smiled at me and said that I looked quite beautiful. He commented on how pale my skin was and how pretty it looked contrasting against my dress. I smiled uncomfortably but began talking to him. It was nice to be acknowledged, but I was still weary. I gave him a fake name, Olivia, and we continued conversing. When the bus stopped at the mall, he asked me what my number was, but I told him that I didn't know him that well and I would see him around. I spent the whole day with my friends, and then it was time to head home. My mother had already arranged to pick me up at the plaza closer to our house, but I still needed to take the bus to this location. As I'm settling down for the ride back, I see the guy coming onto the bus. I hate to admit it, but I was a bit happy to see him on the bus, and when he sat down right beside me again, I was flattered. We talked the whole ride, and when his stop came up, he asked for my number again. This time, I gave him my Facebook instead. He actually laughed when he realized I provided him a fake name and credited me with being smart about it. I am a naturally cautious person and my Facebook didn't contain many personal details or even many pictures as I used it mostly to connect with friends for group assignments or private chat so I didn't feel as nervous about providing him that information. That night, he began messaging me and for a few weeks, we only chatted on Facebook. After a few weeks of chatting, I felt comfortable enough with him to give him my cell phone number and arrange a face-to-face meetup. To my excitement, the meetup goes well. We meet in a public coffee shop and pay our own ways. At the end of the date, we go our own separate ways, and I actually look forward to seeing him again. We make plans to go on another date, but... In about a week, life is a bit crazy around September, and I felt bad for putting off more time together, but he seemed to understand and gave me space. This next date, he planned on his own to give me some time to deal with my personal life, and I thought that was so sweet of him. He wanted to pick me up, but I agreed to meet him at the movie theater instead. We still haven't known each other that long, and I don't want him knowing where I live. I'm so thankful that I made this decision. Also, the theater was in a plaza not far from my house. We went to see Paranormal Activity 2 in the theater. I love scary movies so much, and I find them more funny than scary. The entire movie, I was laughing and having a grand old time. But when I would look at him, he didn't look so pleased. This put me on edge, but I try not to worry and chalk it up to him, not wanting to look scared in front of me, when I'm clearly not afraid. When the movie ends, he proceeds to explain his plan and why he was looking so sour. He was hoping I would get so scared that I would jump into his arms for protection and he would be able to use that as a segue to more intimate activities. The dinner plans we were supposed to have afterwards weren't real, and he was hoping to take me home with him. I am not okay with this plan, so I faked that my mom called me and I have to go home immediately. He asks for a ride as he actually walked over to the theater. I agree and we get in my car and I drive him to his house. I figured out that he didn't have a car at his disposal. It was originally going to pick me up in a friend's car. Also, he lived a two minute walk from the theater. I dropped him off at his house and he goes in for a kiss. I try to turn my face, but he holds it in place. When he finished kissing me, he is talking about how much he loves me and is looking forward to spending all his time with me. I am floored and disgusted with the situation, so I laugh nervously and said goodbye. Before I reverse out of his driveway, he tries to open the driver's side door, 
but thankfully it is locked. My window is slightly rowed down, and he tries to push it down with his fingers. When I don't relent, he proceeds to kiss my window and then lets me leave. I am officially creeped out and I want to get home as fast as I can. For the first few days after the date, I felt very uncomfortable with the whole situation. He was texting me nonstop, and his texts were getting progressively creepier. The texts would range from, I love you, to, I can't wait to marry you, and our babies are going to be the most beautiful babies in the world. It had only been about a month, and he was already talking about babies and marriage. I showed a friend the text and explained the situation. She gave me a huge hug and told me her own story. She suggested that if I was really done with him, that I could break up with him and just because he made the first move, I wasn't approved or tease for ending it. I didn't owe him anything. I felt so much lighter after talking to her that I messaged him right away and broke things off. I went to class thinking it was going to be just that easy, but it wasn't. He proceeded to flood my phone with text messages. At first, he was concerned. He wondered where we went wrong and what did he do to scare me off. When I didn't respond instantaneously, he changed tactics and began saying he was going to kill himself and that I was his soulmate. At this point, I was out of class and able to address his text messages. I called him and explained that I did not feel a connection, that it was better for me to end it early, and that I didn't want to lead him on. I also told him that it was not worth killing yourself over, and that if he was feeling that way, he needed to speak to someone about it. This started a new barrage of texts and voicemails calling me various terrible names and blaming me for leading him on. He said that it was my fault he was going to kill himself and that I was a horrible person. He called my phone constantly, causing me to flat out turn off my phone. This is the point at which I told my mom. She didn't judge me for not telling her earlier, and she was supportive that I tried to handle it my own way but she was angry that he was acting this erratic. She was a bit nervous at his escalation, especially as she works in criminal law and sees the worst of humanity on a daily basis. I followed her advice and texted him that I am not responsible for his choices or behavior, that I stand by my decision to break up with him, that I do not condone the way he is speaking to me that I wouldn't respond anymore, and that if he persists, I will be forced to contact the police. The last part only made things worse, and he continued to send me messages about self-harm. When I stopped responding, he started threatening me and my family. He threatened that he would find me and kill me and then hang himself. I immediately removed him off of Facebook and warned all of my friends not to give out my personal information to anyone. I was comforted knowing he had no idea where I lived, but I frequented that plaza often with my family. I was scared he would see me one day and follow me home. The scary thing was, I lived only five minutes away from him, so it was feasible that he could randomly spot me anywhere in our neighborhood. I became a recluse and the text messages continued. They were getting more and more aggressive. At first he was threatening to kill me, but then he began attacking my family. When he threatened to kill my sister, I lost it. I had had enough and was ready to stand up for myself. I called him and waited. He picked up the phone and tried to act all sweet. I didn't give him any chance to try and smooth things over with me. I told him that threatening me was one thing, but coming after my family was another. I told him he was a horrible person, absolute fucking filth. 
I did say a few things I'm not proud of, but in that moment, they made sense to say. I told him it was over and that I was done with his bullshit. One more attempt at contact and I was going straight to the cops. I reminded him that I knew where he lived and that it would be easy to find him. I like to think it was the last part that scared him because he hung up on me and never, ever contacted me again. For the next little while, I was very cautious about leaving my house, and my family avoided that plaza at all costs. I saved all the threatening text messages just in case and kept my old phone even when I upgraded to a new one. About a year and a half later, my friend decided to look him up on Facebook, against my wishes. She discovered that he moved and I didn't need to worry about a chance meeting with him again. She also discovered that his new fiancé could have passed as my twin. It was unsettling to know that she was almost identical to me, and he had started dating her not long after I told him to finally leave me alone. To the guy that professed his love to me and then threatened to kill himself and me, I really hope you seek professional help and that I never see you again. Nearly 10 years ago, I dated a girl for several months. There had been a few red flags right from the start that I should have listened to, but I was naive and kept telling myself that she was a decent person with a terrible streak of bad luck. Our second date was the first time I went to her apartment. We were having a few drinks and watching movies on her computer and ended up having sex right there on her couch. We start dating officially, and it doesn't take long for her to start exhibiting some of the classic clingy girlfriend traits. I'm a little put off by it, but just tell myself that I'm overreacting, and not to break it off just because she's a little clingy and insecure. A few months later, I was hanging out at her apartment and found a shoebox in her pajama drawer full of things from her last relationship, which was with a guy. I should mention here that I'm a lesbian. Letters, nude photos of them together, all kinds of stuff. I thought it was really strange, beyond the obvious reasons, because everything she told me about this relationship sounded awful. She said he'd hit her, threw her around, say nasty things to her, that he turned her off from men, and generally shitty relationship stuff. When I asked her why she had this box, she shrugged it off and didn't really give me an answer. I'm not a jealous person, so I figured it was some sort of healing process bullshit. Again, naive. And pretty much just forgot about it. Here's where it starts to get real fun. Fast forward a few months. One night we're talking and she tells me this story about a man that her mom dated when she was six or seven years old that she didn't like. The man had a son that was about 10 years old that lived with him. She wanted my mom's boyfriend gone, so she told her mom that he had molested her one night while he was looking after her and his son. He didn't, and had him arrested. The son told police that nothing had happened and that he'd been with her the whole night. But the man went to prison anyway and was beaten to death by a biker gang. She ended this story with a laugh and said, <laughs> I wonder where they buried him. Then just continued on with her day as if she hadn't just dropped this giant what the fuck story on me. To this day, I still don't know if that actually happened or if she made it up to show me how evil she could be. Either one is insane. I decided right then and there that I needed to break it off with her without unleashing the I'll come to your house and kill you in your sleep type of psycho I knew was in her somewhere. It takes a few weeks, but I managed to break up with her. She still messaged me constantly, 
but I was getting better at not being sucked into her guilt trips. Then she started sending me webcam photos of her that I'd never seen before. I didn't connect what they were from until she started sending me videos. Remember that second date at her apartment? She recorded the whole thing on her webcam. I had no idea. My stomach is still in knots and my blood still boils when I think about this. About two months after the breakup, I got an ominous goodbye type message from her also saying she wanted to see me one last time. I lived on the opposite side of the city and really didn't feel like taking a two-hour bus commute to go deal with more of her melodramatic bullshit. So I contacted two of her friends that lived close by, one of which was six months pregnant, and asked if they could go check on her. My day goes on until I got a phone call from the police. They filled me in on what had happened. When the friends went to her apartment, she entered the door wielding a large knife and went ballistic when she realized that I wasn't there. The friends ran and called the police. When officers arrived, they had to put her in handcuffs and brought her to a psych ward. After looking through the apartment, cops found her bedroom covered with lit candles and photos of me and us spread out all over her bed. In the living room, they found a suicide letter that was several pages long. In it, she had talked about my death and how it couldn't be helped. I was in shock, so the cop had to spell it out for me. She had every intention of killing you and then killing herself. You did the right thing by not coming over there. She continued stalking me online. And when I blocked her on all social media platforms, she started sending threatening text messages. I answered long enough to tell her that if she didn't leave me alone, I'd be filing a restraining order against her. This kept her away for a few days, until she showed up at a venue I was working and tried to attack me. Big thanks to the quick reflexes of the security guard on site for keeping me safe that night. The next day, she acts like nothing happened. I filed for a restraining order and wasted six months of my time dealing with courts, only to have the judge dismiss the case as a lady's spat. The stalking eventually stopped, but I was always on high alert. Even today, the sight of magenta and fire hydrant red dye makes my skin crawl. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, crazy stalker stories. I'd like to take a moment and thank the reformed members of the channel. Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elliott, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank each of you for your continued support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these selections. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.